Welcome again, let's talk about keyboards. This is the General Music WX2 and it's a keyboard that my dad bought in 1993 and it is made by the Italian manufacturer General Music in that same year. And well it's quite a nice keyboard, it has a very lovely keybed and some very good piano sounds and it is General MIDI compatible. Uh, there's also a sister model, the WX400. At least that's what the manual says because it is combined WX2 and WX400. So inside these two keyboards are completely identical, but what are the differences between them? Well, the WX2 has 61 regular keyboard keys and the WX400 has 88 weighted piano keys and a wooden enclosure and a wooden stand and it was kind of sold as a digital piano. Other than that, internally they are pretty much identical. So this video is not going to be a repair video, uh, although we are going to replace the battery. Inside is a Nikad battery which is placed on the main circuit board and these things have a tendency to corrode after like 30 years. So it's better to just remove it from the main circuit board and place it somewhere else. So that's what we're going to do later in the video. Uh, but mostly it will be a tour about the computer architecture. I will kind of show you the circuit boards and what kind of chips are on there and kind of how this thing is designed from a computer architecture point of view. But before we start the tour I will point out that I am not a keyboard repair expert. Please don't ask me questions about that. I am not knowledgeable about those sort of things. Uh, that is something for people like Marcus Fuller and uh, Sintower who repair uh, and service keyboards. They are knowledgeable about those sort of things. We are just going to replace a Nikad battery and that's it. So with that being said, let's start the tour. Here we are. Dad brought the WX2 from the attic to his room and he's cleared the table. We've opened up the keyboard. The first thing that we see on the left is the power supply. Next to the right is the analog board with the amplifier section and the DA converters. It appears there are two identical chips labeled AD 865N from analog devices, one for each channel. Close to that are two other chips from ST Microelectronics, the TDA7313 chips, which are digital controlled audio processors. The TDA designator suggests that these parts originated from Philips, but I can't find any info on that other than that they are SGS Thompson or STM parts. Now let's quickly move over to the right side of the keyboard. Here we find the right speaker and the floppy drive compartment. I've already taken the drive out. It's an Epson model SMD300 3.5 inch high density capacity. This is a universal drive with configurable jumpers. You can install it in a PC if you change the device jumper. As this drive is set to DS0, for a PC this would have to be DS1. Unlike a PC, the WX2 uses the original plain vanilla SureGuard interface with a straight through ribbon cable as opposed to most PCs with a twist in the cable. Thus, if you ever have to replace the drive with one sourced from an old PC, you may need to mod the drive as most late era PC drives are hardwired for the DS1 setting. Just something to keep in mind if you want it to work. The floppy controller is a box standard Western Digital WD 37C65C, thus entirely compatible with what you would find in a PC. These chips were used on some floppy I.O. controller cards in PC clones in the early 90s, i.e. they are made for AT compatibles and the like. So let's go over the board real quick. The first chip we see is a Z8621 AALB1 by ST Microelectronics. This is an 8-bit microcontroller used for the key scanning, it's the sub-CPU. It's originally a Zilog part, but it's not related to the Z80. Next is the Motorola 68302. It's the main CPU and it's clocked at a whopping 16 MHz. It's basically a 68000 but with some extra features designed for embedded systems. It has an integrated UART for serial interfaces, so it handles the MIDI I.O. directly. In theory this chip could run the same code as an Amiga, Atari ST or Sega Mega Drive, but a tad faster. If you remember one of my previous videos about my imaginary Sega Mega Drive Pro system concept then you know what I mean. And ah, oh dear, it's a battery! A rechargeable Nikad destroyer of worlds! 
We replaced this later with a nickel metal hydride mounted on a separate board far away from the main PCB. I'll show you the solution we came up with later in the video. As you can see, the old battery is already starting to corrode. Luckily we caught it just in time. Moving over to the left we find the three Mascom chips labeled MSK1, MSK2 and MSK3. These are 16 megabit or 2 megabytes each which hold the instrument samples. So there's 6 megabytes of samples built in. Next we have the three VLSI chips. These are custom ASICs that are General Music's own design. They are supposedly DSPs according to the service manual. What they really are capable of and how they compare to more generic DSPs is unknown. VLSI technology was very popular in the early 90s and a go-to company if you needed custom chips in your design. Many well-known computer companies such as Acorn, Apple, Atari and many more worked with them. On the right side of the VLSI trio we find 4 EPROMs of 4 megabits, 512 kilobytes each. Two of them are used for the operating system and the other two hold the sound data, possibly the built-in styles. So in total we've got 2 megabytes here, of which the OS uses half of it. Left and right of these 4 EPROMs are the two Statagram chips. One is 8 kilobytes and the other is 138 kilobytes. That's not a lot of RAM. It's very likely that one of them is used in conjunction with the battery to store the date and time and the user preferences. The other chip is probably the work RAM. Which one of those that would be, I don't know. I reckon the 128 kilobyte one, as that would make the most sense, since you can load MIDI files and samples from floppy disk, and 8 kilobytes would be a tad small for that. Now let's move to the upper part of the case. Here's the back of the LCD. It contains 4 driver chips from Oki. Be careful of that LCD module though, as the backlight contains a high voltage part. It's 700 volts, no touchy! The display has a resolution of 260 by 64. So let's move on over back to the analog board. We can see the TDA chips and the DAX. Now in a bit more detail, as well as all the audio input and output jacks. Let's take a look at the keyboard mechanism. It's pretty good. It has a very good feel and response. This key mechanism is velocity sensitive and it has aftertouch. Each key contains two rubber dome contact points similar to a TV remote or a game controller in design. The aftertouch contact point is mounted a bit higher and further away from the hinge point. You actually have to press down quite a bit when the key is bottomed out to activate it. All of the key switches are connected to one long flex cable. The I.O. is handled by a Zilog Z8 microcontroller, which is the key scanner CPU. I find this keypad to be of a higher quality in comparison to my EMU Xboard 49. It's very silent in operation, whereas the EMU Xboard has a cheaper, noisier and more plasticky feel to it. Here's the battery we took out. We caught this destroyer of circuit boards just in time before it could spill its battery acid guts. Now let's go over the board. We've taken it out so we can see it in a bit more detail. This is the spot on the circuit board where the battery used to be. We're going to solder in some wires to a piece of strip board for the new battery, safely mounted far away from the main PCB. Let's take a look at the speakers and the speaker grills. The foam is this type of degrader foam. It's slowly perishing and crumbling. The speaker cones are not as flexible anymore like what they used to be. We could replace them if it really go to town with this, but we leave this all as is. It's not too important to me, the speakers still work and sound fine. I mostly use the WX2 as a controller keyboard for my iPad these days. However, the speakers might need restoring in the future. Hopefully they will last, the instrument is about 28 years old at the time of recording. Obviously we removed the crumbling foam bits where they've fallen apart. Now it's time for the big fix. Look at it! The new battery on its own little daughter board mounted behind an easy access panel in place where otherwise the video card option would be mounted. Yes, there actually exists a video card for the WX2. 
It's got a pretty basic graphics chip, but it outputs RGB or composite video. Believe it or not, the optional video card actually has its own Motorola 68302 CPU on it. has been reassembled. So let's test it out. I've inserted the WX demo disc, which loads some styles, but I won't be using them. Let's go over some of the built-in ROM sounds instead. Contrary to what some repair video says, the demo disc is not really required after a new battery. All of the factory sounds, styles and the complements are stored in ROM, so they are permanent. There's no need to load factory presets from disc at all. The demo disc contains some files that show off the capabilities of the WX2. Please don't ask me for disc images, I can't share them. You can however load any standard MIDI files from disc in general MIDI format. This is great if you have some MIDI files from old DOS games such as Duke Nukem 3D or other general MIDI compliant files. Maybe in the future I will make some of my own arrangements if I can find the time for it. Now let's play some of the built in sounds. this video about the General Music WX2. Um, we replaced the battery which was a NICAT with now a slightly more modern battery and we placed it on a different circuit board so that it is far away from the main PCB. I showed you a little bit about the built-in sounds, the, the grand piano and some of the others, um, but also the WX2 is really great with MIDI. It has two MIDI uh, buses, two MIDI outs, two MIDI ins. It is Perfect to use with other instruments such as Cork Volcas that I have here connected to my Emu X board. I have a Volca Keys, a Volca FM1, a Volca FM2. They all go to 
a uh, MIDI through box and normally this setup is connected to an iPad. So you can easily add something like a Volca FM2 and kind of layer the sounds. Uh, it's a very nice thing to do actually. You've got well, a really good high quality piano sound here or some other sounds like the, um, let's see, where's this, that cool tremolo sound for instance, this one. Those are lovely to layer with some uh, FM sounds from the Volca FM2. Absolutely amazing. So uh, with that being said, I hope you enjoyed it and thanks for watching. Bye bye.